Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Famularo. I'm with the Dauphin County Library System. Um, welcome to our Live and Learn program for July, continuation of our Making Monuments conversation. Um, our um, organizer, Len Wood Sloan, is going to be joining us in just a little bit, but we wanted to make sure that we could get started um, with all the wonderful presenters that we have to share information with us today. Um, so our first, um, sorry, our first presenter is Jeremiah Will, uh, Miller um, from Lancaster PA. So Jeremiah, go ahead and take it away. Well, hello everyone. And uh, thank you for including me in this, uh, in this great little event you have going. Um, I'm speaking to you from Lancaster, Pennsylvania and uh, McCaskey High School, where I serve as the coordinator of alumni affairs. Um, McCaskey High School is a beautiful old building in Lancaster, and it serves the second oldest school district in Pennsylvania. Um, and for that reason, we have a very robust alumni association. Um, you don't often hear of alumni associations uh, being uh, connected with, with high schools, especially public high schools. Uh, but due to the fact that we are such an old high school um, and our alumni are very proud to have, have gone here, um, we have a very robust alumni association. And you can learn more about um, the organization that I work for um, at McCaskeyAlumni.org. That's our website. Um, I too am a graduate of McCaskey, uh, but when I started working here in the Alumni Center um, in about 2015, I discovered just how many extraordinary alumni have passed through the walls of this building. Um, and even to this day, I don't think any one of them has ever reached the level of global acclaim uh, that Barney Yule reached. Um, Barney Yule was a member of the very first class at McCaskey, the class of 1938. Um, to make a very long story short, um, there was a time in the 1930s and early 1940s when Barney Yule was the fastest human, the fastest man in the world. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that he was the greatest high school sprinter ever to come from Pennsylvania. Um, he was already being referred to as the future Jesse Owens when he was a student here at McCaskey. Um, and he was being referred uh, as that moniker by people all over the country. There were news stories about him all over America in the sports pages because everyone knew there was this track and field prodigy here at McCaskey High School. Um, and people were really looking forward to the 1940 Olympics when he would come of age to be an Olympic sprinter. Of course, uh, many of you if not all of you know of Jesse Owens, who was the star of the 1936 Olympics. And really the 1940 Olympics were slated to be Barney Yule's heyday. They were, they were slated to be the Barney Yule Olympics. Barney Yule's story is one of, of many challenges and disappointments. Um, the first... I'm sorry, I'm just making sure that's not my audio. <laughs> One of the first great... You all hear me okay? Um, the first great challenge of Barney Yule's life was that um, he suffered from polio as a child. Um, it's hard for many people to believe that uh, because of the fact that he became the fastest sprinter in the world. Uh, but he had a partially paralyzed left leg as a child, and it was in an effort to regain the strength of his leg that he began running. Uh, another great challenge for him was that he came of age as a sprinter during World War II. Um, as I said, the papers around the country were seeing him as the next Jesse Owens, but there would be no successor to Jesse Owens, unfortunately, because the Olympics of 1940 were canceled, um, and then the Olympics of 1944 were canceled. So Barney Yule would not be able to compete in the Olympics until the age of 30. Uh, but that did not stop him from being an extraordinary um, star of track and field throughout the 1940s. He was 
um, leading the sports pages uh, in the sports pages around the country and newspapers around the country, um, breaking world records, matching world records. And then when 1948 came along and the Olympics were finally back, many people felt that Barney Yule was, you know, he was 30 years old. They thought he was past his prime, but he shocked the sports world by not only qualifying for the 1948 Olympics, um, he also matched the world record in the 100 meters dash at the Olympic qualifying race. So Barney Ewell went to England to compete in the 1948 Olympics, and he won a gold medal for the four by 100 meter relay with his fellow American teammates. And he also won uh, two silver medals. I think ultimately his age did contribute to his not taking home the gold in his, some of his favorite events. Uh, but nevertheless, Barney Yule became a gold medal winner at the age of 30, which was a remarkable accomplishment, especially for the time. So um, getting back to the present, um, when I, I got hired here, um, I saw that we have this extraordinary story. Um, and even as a, a graduate of McCaskey, I had not been familiar with Barney Yule's story. Um, many Lancastrians were, but his legacy was really starting to fade. So. Um, we formed a committee, um, which included myself, a former mayor of Lancaster named uh, Art Morris, and um, a former county commissioner named Ron Ford, and a philanthropist here in town and businessman named Ken Stout. And we came together and decided that we would, um, that we would form a committee to try to revive the legacy of Barney Yule. Um, we realized we were doing this at a time when we were approaching his 100th birthday. So we scheduled a, uh, a Barney Yule week in Lancaster. We had free events all over the city, right in the middle of the town square. We had the mayor announce that it was Barney Yule week. Um, we also had an event at the Lancaster train station because that was the location where the Lancaster community sent Barney Yule off to compete in the Olympics. and. When he returned, there was an enormous crowd there. They say there were more people waiting for Barney Yule's return than there were to greet President Roosevelt when he came to visit Lancaster. Um, so it, it's really uh, an extraordinary story. And uh, we held this week of events. And once it was over, we realized, you know, we've done this great thing and so many more of the young people know who Barney Yule is, but we haven't done anything permanent. Um, and we decided that a great way to celebrate him in a permanent manner here in Lancaster was a bronze statue. Uh, so we got together with the city of Lancaster and um, you know, the, the mayor approved this idea um, as did the public art advisory board here in Lancaster. And we released a request for proposal uh, that we put together um, for artists. Um, we disseminated that a number of months ago. Um, we had about 20 artists from across the state of Pennsylvania reach out to us, and we did stipulate that we wanted to use a Pennsylvania artist. Um, and uh, we also wanted to make sure that we got a diverse group of artists um, contributing something because uh, we are representing a Black athlete, Black American here. So we wanted to make sure that we um, represented a diverse group of candidates. Um, in any event, uh, we appointed an artist selection committee here in Lancaster, and um, we had a, a local gallery owner, a local art collector, uh, a couple of artists sit on this committee, this selection committee, and um, after the RFP was disseminated, they reviewed all of the, of the materials that came back to us. They narrowed it down to three finalists for this position to sculpt the Barney Yule statue. Um, we paid each of those uh, candidates uh, an honorarium uh, so that they could go off and then put together a proposal for us. And then uh, we received their proposals and we interviewed all three of them uh, and finally decided to go with an artist by the name of Chad Fisher. Um, and Mr. Fisher has a foundry here in, um, in Pennsylvania, in Dillsburg. And he has represented a lot of famous athletes in the past. He's done a lot of work for the Philadelphia 76ers um, in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Flyers, um, the Chicago Bears out in Chicago. 
and he has done statues of people like Charles Barkley, uh, Maurice Cheeks, uh, many, many famous athletes, Walter Payton. Um, so this is really uh, his area of expertise. And um, we have recently uh, signed a contract with Mr. Fisher and he is just getting started right now on his process. He really likes to get to know his subject as closely as possible, um, even down to uh, probing the family members about what kind of music Barney you will like to listen to so that he can really uh, kind of almost spiritually connect with the person that he's representing. Um, and uh, we're thrilled to have Mr. Fisher. And this project is slated to be finished in about a year. So we will dedicate the statue in the summer of 2022 in Yule Plaza, which has been named for Barney Yule. And it's right in downtown Lancaster. And our committee actually played a huge role in having that plaza renamed for Mr. Yule uh, so that um, it would be a, a perfect location to honor him in this permanent way. So with that, I'll just see if anyone has any questions for me about this process. We would love to, uh, I'd love to take your questions. Jeremiah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about Mr. Fisher, the artist? Uh, sure. Um, he, uh, so like I said, he, he, he lives in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, he attended the uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, um, which has a, a great sculpture program. Um, his father is an artist as well and kind of helps to run, run the foundry. Um, and, uh, like I said, his passion has really been for, for um, sculpting athletes. And um, th there's a long list that you, can, that you can see if you go to his website. I think I provided that link for you. Um, I don't know if we can open that up right now, but you can see a long uh, list of the, the sculptures he's created. Um, Good afternoon, friends. I have uh, joined you. I'm sorry I had such technical problems here, but can we bring up that website, Christine? Hello? Yes. <laughs> sorry, I'm not sharing my screen. Can everyone see the website? Yes. Okay. Great. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I think if you scroll down, you can see more. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, Marion Ross uh, on the left there. Uh, she's an actress who was uh, in Happy Days. He just unveiled that statue. Um, as you see next to her is Charles Barkley um, at the Philadelphia 76ers Stadium. Um, uh, next to that is a statue that he's done in a, a veterans park. Uh, below is Walter Payton with the Chicago Bears. Um, George Hallis, who is actually one of the owners of the Chicago Bears. Um, there's an interesting connection with the Chicago Bears and McCaskey High School. Um, it was the, it was, uh, the McCaskey family um, that ended up um, owning the Chicago Bears at one point. Um, Julius Irving. To the right, below that, Bobby Jones from the Philadelphia 76ers. So all of his work is there available on the website if you'd like to take a closer look. So everybody who is watching will make sure to um, follow up in an email tomorrow with a link um, to this website for you all to enjoy. I see a question from Angela. Does he have uh, descendants living? Yes, he has. Uh, um, he has a, his daughter and his son and his granddaughter are still with us, and they'll be working very closely with with Mr. Fisher. Um, yes, he did spend uh, the rest of his life in Lancaster. Um, he was 
um, not only uh, a revered athlete, but uh, he really was sort of a beloved man about town. Um, for anyone who knows Lancaster, the a favorite pastime is spending time at the uh, local Central Market downtown, the Farmer's Market, and Barney Ewell was, was regularly there um, and uh, really a, a very affable person and um, everyone loved seeing him and running into him at the market. Uh, the preliminary rendering, uh, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, uh, Mr. Fisher created uh, a maquette of the, of the statue that, that, we might, that he might use um, as he moves forward. Um, that was one of the requirements that we put forward to our, our finalists was that they create a maquette. Um, and he did create a small clay model that he shared with us. Jeremiah, I'm sorry I'm not able to connect with you. I'm on location uh, for a film and I'm not able to pick up uh, a Wi-Fi on my laptop or my notebook. I was with Christine at the beginning. She asked me how everything was going and that was the last question before everything went out. But I'd like to ask you if you have uh, talked about the relationship of the statue to the plaza itself and the the, uh, the environment and the collaboration. If you'll talk our, our colleagues and guests through the location where the where the statue is going and the relationship of your society to the to the larger project. Yeah, well, it, it'll be in a very central uh, location. Um, the, the city has, has, has made that decision. Um, so it'll be, be right there, um, basically in the center of the plaza, as far as I understand. Um, the, the discussions are, are continuing about that, but it'll be, it'll be central, a very central location in the plaza. Yes, and the, um, the Yule Plaza is a collaborative project uh, with the city, the Lancaster Public Library, the Parking Authority, and another pair of artists who will join us in our next session, uh, R and R Associates, Design Associates, will be designing the larger plaza environment which the statue will sit in. And there is a third entity that will be doing the landscaping for the plaza. And so this is a unique project in which three separate but overlapping commissions have been granted. One for the plaza, one for the landscaping and, and environment, and then the partnership with the society for the statue itself. It's a very uh, unique, uh, cooperative and collaborative. Yes. Engagement. I see a question from Randy Harris. Uh, tell the folks about Barney's in international races. Um, Randy, uh, thank you. Randy was was part of our initial phase of this project when we were raising awareness about Barney Yule during Barney Yule week um, in Lancaster. Um, Barney, um, even though he was not able to compete in the Olympics, um, he ended up becoming a professional uh, racer um, in, in, a, in kind of an injustice. Uh, when he returned to Lancaster, he was given a, a home by the community um, and he lost his amateur status on that basis. They, the um, National Athletic um, uh, Association, um, the track and field organization said that uh, he was now a professional because he had accepted this home. Um, and so he lost his amateur status, um, which was a, a rather um, unwarranted. Uh, but he ended up competing professionally um, in places like Scotland and Australia. Um, the, uh, the Scottish version of USA Today, uh, which is known as the Scotsman, uh, recently ran a, a full front page story in the sports section about Barney Yule and, and what a stir he created and how exciting it was when he came and ran in Scotland. Um, so he won numerous international prizes as a professional following the Olympics. So it was incredible that he was able to compete as well as he did in the Olympics at age 30, but he even 
continued to compete internationally beyond that time. Um, the question, another question, uh, do you know if Lancaster, uh, McCaskey High and or middle school has begun any kind of curriculum material on Barney Yule and their social studies history or history courses? Um, I think mean, that's from Eric Jackson. Um, the, the curriculum was updated somewhat when we did our, our Barney Yule week celebration. And we made sure that the, the school district of Lancaster kind of included uh, something about Barney Yule and the overall curriculum. Um, after all, that was the whole point of why we're doing this is we want his legacy uh, to live on. I also know that Chad Fisher, who is the, our sculptor, is interested in having students take part in the design of the base. Um, he's interested in having the gold and silver medals that, that Yule won depicted somehow on the base, and he would like to get our students involved in that design. So I think that that's a great concept. Um, we also produced a documentary that I directed. It's called uh, Breaking Through the Barney Yule Story. Um, and you can see that on, on YouTube. Again, it's called Breaking Through the Barney Yule Story. And I've done my best to share that with teachers and make them aware that that's available. It's an hour long, so it kind of covers everything I don't have time to cover today. Could you um, talk about the uh the impact on the current students uh, at the high school and their families? Sure. Well, um, you know, Denise Yule, who is, is Barney's daughter, is, is a wonderful speaker. Um, and uh, a lot of his high school running was actually done at what is now Fulton Elementary School, because that used to be the Lancaster Boys High School. Um, and so a, a, lot of, a lot of his high school a scholastic career was there. So we thought it would be great to um, invite uh, the students from Fulton Elementary, which is now an elementary school, to the auditorium and, and hear from Denise, who, who did a great job of, of telling his story to young people and, and really exciting those elementary school students about Barney Yule. We showed the footage of him running in the Olympics, which is, um, you know, such an exciting piece of footage. Um, and the students really, really responded well to it. Um, at McCaskey, I've noticed that especially the, the student athletes have been greatly inspired by this story. And we've made uh, a fervent attempt to include the McCaskey track students uh, when we have Barney Yule related events. Um, Nathan Henderson, who's a, a wonderful runner from the state of Pennsylvania, he's now a runner for Syracuse University. Um, he has been highly involved in, in the work that we're doing. So I think I can say that um, from the time that I was a student at McCaskey, um, having graduated you know, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago now, uh, there, there's been a huge shift to today, uh, whereas now you know, the students really know who Barney Yule was and he's part of the fabric of our, of our high school story, which was not the case 20 years ago, I don't and may I ask you one uh, last question, Jeremiah? What have you learned about yourself in the process of this project? Well, um, you know, Barney Yule's story, um, when, I, when I was making the film and, you know, thinking about his life and obviously preparing to, uh, to dedicate this, this statue in honor of him, um, it's interesting because Barney Yule's story is not one of tremendous triumph at the end. Um, even when he won his, his gold medal, the American team was disqualified initially um, uh, because of a bad call made by one of the judges. And so he was not even given the, um, you know, that wonderful moment where they play the Star Spangled Banner and you stand on the platform and you're given the gold medal. I think he was eating his lunch in the cafeteria with the other athletes and they just walked in and handed him his gold medal. So I've told you about all of these disappointments and challenges that he faced. Um, and, um, but I think what I learned it, as, a, as a filmmaker struggling to put this story together 
is that the triumph really is in the resilience, is in the, the pushing forward, the not giving up. And that's something that Barney Yule certainly never did was give up. Um, and that's really where, where, how you win. That's, that's the real, that's the real Olympic moment is when you don't give up. We believe that uh, public art is supposed to change the lives for the people who live with the art and pass by it constantly, for the people who have a casual relationship uh, to it, for the people who are looking down from the hotel onto the plaza and see it. And so I, I was uh, encouraged by hearing how it changed your life and what they got process. Um, and the, my, my actual last question is, what do you think this will do for the landscape of Lancaster? Well, you know, Lancaster has been perceived as, especially lately, um, you know, uh, as being kind of a, a refugee capital. We, we had, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the Nobel laureate, uh, Malala Yousafzai actually visited McCaskey not long ago. It was a huge surprise. You know, she, uh, unfortunately, I think she still has death threats. You know, she's this young woman who, who's a free speech advocate, and she was, uh, I guess, being hunted by the Taliban. Um, and um, she, she was not, um, she did not announce that she was going to be coming um, because I think she has certain safety protocols that she has. But she, she arrived at McCaskey one day and they, they called all the students down for this assembly with her. And it was just this extraordinary moment of having this Nobel laureate on the McCaskey stage. Um, and, you know, um, her message was, I'm here because I've heard that you're a welcoming place, you know. Um, Lancaster, like everywhere else, certainly has, has work to do. Um, but, you know, it's great that we, uh, th there must be a reason we have some of that reputation. Um, and certainly, um, Barney Yule did not get the attention he deserved in his lifetime. He had a lot of admirers, um, but um, uh, we, we've come a long way, I, I, I hope. Um, and the fact that we are going to be honoring this person it is an extraordinary thing when you consider, and Lenwood, you may know, know this better than I, but I don't think there's a statue of an African-American in, in Lancaster County. Um, so no, this, there is not. Yeah. And so, you, you hope will be the third. So this, this will be a Thank first. You. Thank you so much, Jeremiah. We wish you all the best of luck, and uh, I, I compliment you for the diplomacy of the uh, the actualization of the statue while the dynamic around the plaza as an art piece and the landscaping and the partnership uh, and also for negotiating the Straits of Magellan which is also called the pandemic um, which uh, you all navigated yourself through we look forward to, to seeing that that statue and all the neighborhood that Barney lived in will be there at the unveiling to salute and applaud you. Absolutely. Uh, I am, in addition to the uh, chair of the Public Arts Advisory Board, I am honored to be a member of the African American Irish Diaspora Network. A mouthful of acronyms, but a very important crossroads of two cultures. And in that capacity, I worked with uh, my colleagues on a film short on Frederick Douglass's visit to Ireland. And our two next guests, who are both board members of Aiden, can talk to you about Frederick Douglass has tripped to Ireland a bit. This dynamic uh, sculpture of Frederick Douglass and their unique idea of creating a model of the sculpture for a national tour up to cities that Frederick. And so may I introduce Christine and Dawn to our colleagues. 
Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, it's so great to be here. Thank you, Lenny. Um, we are on the board together. It's such a pleasure to work with you all the time. And I just want to start by saying um, thank you to Jeremiah, because that was just a fascinating story. And in some ways, I think it resonates with what Dan and I are going to be talking about. And I think also something I'm very interested in, all these hidden histories, which you know, deserve to be known and Barney Yule, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, definitely his story deserves to be better known. My question to Jeremiah was, did you ever get to Ireland? Of course, that's my question. <laughs> so always I ask. So I'm, um, I'm Christine Keneally, I'm an Irish historian and I teach at Quinnipiac University and Director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute. And this is Don Mellon. So. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christine and Jeremiah. I find that absolutely fascinating as well, and it also resonates with you know what Christine and I have been doing, and that is, you know, taking stories that need to be told and need to be resurrected mm -hmm. as sources of inspiration and bringing them to public attention. So there's a lot in what you and your colleagues have done in relation to Barney Yule that uh, is really fascinating and. Uh, what we love. And of course, uh, we'll be focusing tonight on Frederick Douglass and the Frederick Douglass Monument. Uh, but, you know, recently we have discussed, um, and this is very much thanks to wonderful research done by Christine, that, you know, we're going to focus on a Frederick Douglass Daniel O'Connell Day uh, each year, which would be around the 29th of September when we'll have a Daniel O'Connell uh, Frederick Douglass lecture. Um, alternative years going between the United States and, and Ireland um, and really focus that day on a special Douglas O'Connell day. But um, we've decided we're not going to put our sole focus on uh, just simply Frederick Douglas because uh, Christine can address this a little bit as well that you know what we have discovered is that there were many, many abolitionists who actually came to Ireland less well known than Frederick Douglas and yet their intentions were as important. And so that's why I think the research that Christine and the new book that she's doing uh, is going to be important. And I actually feel that out of that, there are probably maybe one or two other statues that may be raised um, you know, of African-Americans. Uh, in relation to Frederick Douglass, um, you know, one of the things that I have been really interested in doing, uh, I'm not interested in commemorations, I feel commemoration sometimes getting in the way of what's really important in history. I'm more interested in legacy. You know, I always think of trees, for example, of being kind of the, the great monuments of nature. But who planted the tree? We don't know. But the tree remains there sometimes for hundreds of years. And, and that's why I began to orientate towards, you know, the idea of bronze memorial, because they are pieces of art that last for hundreds of years and can inspire and inform people. Uh, but what I'm also aware of is that very often it's the art of empire. So like there are too many monuments uh, glorifying war, glorifying empire, and far too many monuments to men. And very few monuments to uh, people of color. And so that's one of the things that Christine and I are interested in trying to address. Obviously, we ourselves won't change that, but you know, if we can be a source of inspiration for other people, also, um, you know, to think of more women and more people of color and those stories, um, then I think we can start to rebalance uh, what's absolutely necessary. Okay. So really so, delighted to be here. Yeah. Me too. Um, I just want to apologise. My dog has decided he wants to be part of this. So Koo, it's an Irish name, Koo Cullen. Um, so he's here. I hope you don't mind. I hope nobody minds um, my dog Zoom bombing us. So uh, Don and I have put together a little presentation. So I'm going to try and share the screen and we'll talk through. We'd be delighted to answer questions. And just let's hope the technology works. OK, Don, does that work for us? Yeah, that's working there. I can see it. Okay. Um, okay. So again, thank you, um, Lenny, for inviting us. And as Lenny said, uh, 
Lenny, Don, myself are members of the African American Irish Diaspora Network, which we um, call AIDEN for short. And Don talked about the lecture series. We hope to start 29th of September this year. And that is one of the many things that um, AIDEN have done in its very short existence. And also, Lenny mentioned, um, we're working on a documentary about Frederick Douglass, but very much putting him in a cultural context. So it really, I think, adds a whole dimension to how we understand what Frederick Douglass did, uh, the influences on his life, etc. Anyway, so that's me a few years ago, and that's Don. And Don didn't say, but Don is from Derry. And I've known Don almost 30 years, we're great friends. And he is an incredible human rights activist and pretty well known for a lot of the campaigns he's been involved. Um, Bloody Sunday, if you know anything about Irish history um, in terms of um, resisting apartheid, etc. cetera. So um, Don is somebody who, um, if you're in trouble, you want him to be on your side because he always has your back. He's a great person. So that's us. Um, and we thought we'd try and set this in some sort of context because we're both Irish and you, if you know anything about Irish history, you'll know that Ireland was England's first colony and that colonial relationship, which has not been a great relationship for many reasons, dates back to the 12th century. And so we often talk about your know, 800 years of British rule. Um, some people will say with validity that that rule has not ended because as you know, Northern Ireland to this day remains part of the United Kingdom, which is another story. But because of Ireland's long colonial past, there were many statues that when part of Ireland became independent, they were not too happy with. And these are just some of the monuments. You might understand why uh, people weren't too happy with them. The man on the horse is William of Orange, the famous Protestant leader who's very beloved of Protestants in the north. And that statue is a few hundred years old. But this image is from 1805. And some people in Dublin were painting him black because very famously he is William of Orange. Um, a few years later, some students attempted to blow him up not successfully. And when Ireland gained semi-independence after 1921, William of Orange was taken down. So that statue is no more, but he was very symbolic of the colonial past and a past dominated by Protestantism. And um, the woman on my right, you might recognize Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria ruled from 1837 to 1901. When Ireland became a republic in 1949, they decided they no longer wanted this pretty ugly four ton statue. And so you can see her being removed. Um, she's famously remembered as the famine queen. She presided over the worst famine in modern European history. Um, you probably know at least one million people died. Um, these are statues commemorating so-called heroes. One of them is Trafalgar, hero of um, the Battle of Trafalgar, 1805. And he had a very grand statue in the middle of Dublin. Um, it's before my time, but people could climb to the top of it and see over the vista of Dublin. But in 1966, the Irish Republican army blew the statue to smithereens of us no more. And then the final statue is Derry. And as Derry is Don's hometown, I'm going to let Don explain the history of this statue. Yeah, it was uh, a Derry column that uh, was on the Derry walls on elevated land and it overlooked the bog side and the brandy well and was visible from the Cragen, which were three large, um, mainly Catholic nationalist Republican areas. And it would be a place where, you know, many orange men, particularly on the, the 12th of August, when they celebrated the closing of the gates of Derry in 1689 um, against the forces of King James, who was a Catholic king, and, and who, of course, then met uh, William of Orange in the Battle of the Boyne the following year. Um, but it was always seen as, uh, particularly, um, you know, a symbol of uh, Protestants, you know, lording over the Catholics. And indeed, uh, in around, I think it was the, sometime just before Christmas each year, December, there would be Lundy's Day when they would burn an effigy of Lundy, who was considered to be a traitor, who apparently wanted to open the gates to the forces of King James. And uh, they would burn this huge effigy, uh, actually, on the monument 
so that the Catholics below could, could actually see it. And, and I remember actually, uh, I was with friends from college, I think it was around 1971, and we were gathered in a house in the Craigan when we heard a huge explosion. And as we were walking home, then we heard the news that in fact the IRA had actually blown up the statue of Governor Walker. Governor Walker was um, a minister, a bit like if you can think of Ian Paisley, he was uh, um, a charismatic religious leader and political leader within the city. And he was the one to have seen, you know, or seemed to have overseen the, the holding out. What came, became actually the, the longest siege in, in British history. Uh, I think it went on for about 189 days. And the statue showed them pointing to God because God was delivering them as good Protestant people and then pointing you know, northwards towards uh, the River Foyle, showing that uh, ships were coming to relieve um, mm -hmm. the garrison town. Um, so anyway, as I said, the IRA decided, as they did in 1966, to actually blow up Walker's Pillar, and uh, the only thing that remains now is the plinth um, with railing around it, but uh, the statue is no more and the Dory column is gone. Okay, so I know there's a lot of history there, but that sort of gives you a brief overview of some of Ireland's controversial history, um, sad history in many ways, and also its relationship to statues which were imposed and not really um, of the people. And then just bringing us right up to date, um, as we know statues are in the news at the moment and very controversial. Uh, on the left is the statue of Edward Colston, who was involved in the slave trade in Bristol in England. And very spontaneously, he was removed from his plinth and thrown in the local river. And that is just last year. And then again this week, statues again in the news. And you probably know better than I do, um, Robert E. Lee is being um, very gracefully in some ways removed. But definitely he's being removed. So we all know statues are um, tell us a lot about society and about changes, etc. So we, uh, as you hear, want to talk about Frederick Douglass. Um, Don has been involved in promoting the story of Frederick Douglass in Ireland for maybe 30 years. And it was Don who first encouraged me to do more research on it. I'd already started to look at abolition in Ireland. And Don encouraged me to transcribe Frederick Douglass's speeches which I did, it took me eight years. Um, so Frederick Douglass came to Ireland in 1845. He intended to stay for four days, but he was made so welcome, he stayed for four months. And during that time, he gave almost 50 speeches. Um, some of them, they he would speak for two hours without notes. He didn't write his speeches down. So I had to track them down in the local newspapers. But Frederick Douglass described his time in Ireland as being the happiest moments of his life and as being transformative. He arrived in Ireland 31st of August 1845 and that night he wrote to William Lloyd Garrison saying he felt safe in dear old Ireland and for Frederick this was a unique experience he'd never felt safe before and after two weeks in Ireland he again wrote to Garrison saying for the first time in his life he felt equal he could not witness prejudice um, wherever he went. There was no evidence of prejudice. And again, this proved to be a very liberating experience for him. So for Don and I, we are very interested in how you know, Ireland, with its sad colonial history, Ireland that was about to undergo this devastating famine, how it really impacted on this 27 year old so-called fugitive slave us now, we see him as a freedom seeker, um, but how it impacted on his political outlook. And I know Don would like to say more about that. Well, uh, I, I think that the most important thing is that when Frederick Douglass came to Ireland, he came mm -hmm. as a single issue uh, campaigner, which was the ending of slavery in the United States. Uh, but after hearing Daniel O'Connell uh, address a huge uh, repeal um, meeting uh, in Conciliation Hall in Dublin uh, on the 29th of September 1845. Uh, he was so taken by the breadth of O'Connell's vision, and particularly the fact that O'Connell wasn't only interested in um, the emancipation of Irish people and particularly Irish Catholics, but he was actually concerned about the plight of poor and oppressed people all over the world. That that evening he reported back to Garrison almost verbatim the speech that O'Connell had given, 
And then when you trace the letters he's continuing to send to Gareth over the next few months, you can actually see how his thinking is changing to the point where he's actually saying it's not enough for us to be only concerned about uh, ending slavery in America. We've got to be concerned about people the world over. And I think the great gift that Ireland gave to Frederick Douglass was that when he left Ireland, he left as an internationalist. And in fact, he went on to become himself um, a great uh, statesman and an elderly statesman in his own right in the way that O'Connell was in Ireland at the time when he met him as a 27-year-old. And again, this is just Frederick Douglass's own words where he talks about, and this is after two weeks in Ireland, one of the most pleasing features of my visit thus far has been a total absence of all manifestations of prejudice against me on account of my colour. I find myself not treated as a colour, but as a man, not as a thing, but as a child of the common father of all of us. And again, you know, this combined with hearing about Ireland history, meeting, he actually met Daniel O'Connell, really proved to be a liberating, transformative experience. So uh, Frederick left Ireland January 1846 and you know, leaving, he said it was the happiest moment of his life. And he had a great impact on Ireland. He, uh, his final place to visit was Belfast. And when he was leaving, uh, there was a breakfast in his honour, uh, a member of the British Parliament attended to again tell you with what respect he was held. And at the meeting, it was announced that a Belfast Ladies Anti-Slavery Society was going to be revived. So again, you know, Ireland had an impact on Frederick Douglass, but Frederick Douglass definitely had an impact on Ireland. And we know from his writings, he often would compare the plight of the Irish poor with what he had seen on plantations. So he found it to be deeply, deeply moving. He hadn't expected to see such poverty in part of the British Empire. So as we said, you know, Frederick never forgot Ireland and Ireland never forgot Frederick. And scattered around Ireland, there are various plaques that honour the memory of Frederick Douglass. And um, the mural, the artwork you see below is from Belfast. And I know Don was quite closely um, involved in some of the early murals. Well, it was just that um, I had gone to Belfast to um, uh, photograph the, the mural on the right hand side uh, to, to discover that it had been painted over and uh, on the occasion of President Obama first mentioning um, the visit to Ireland and the transformative impact Ireland had on Frederick Douglass during a St. Patrick's Day gathering in the White House I think it was around maybe 2009 I think it was his first St. Patrick's Day uh, as president um, I happened to meet uh, Jerry Adams and he talked about the mural. I said, Jerry, I went up to photograph it because I wanted to use it as the cover of a book. And um, he was quite surprised to hear that the mural had been painted over because it, it's, it's a, an international wall and they're constantly updating it in terms of different causes, you know, that concern people. And, um, and when he heard that, um, Jerry actually made a phone call and just said, look, I think we really need to ensure that Frederick Douglass is, is given a, an honoured place. And so this entire wall was painted. And what was really lovely is that it involved uh, artists from both sides. It's, it's actually right on what's known as the peace line. It's a line that divides, you know, um, loyalist and, and Republican areas. And in the context of the peace process, um, there were, were artists from both sides of the divide who actually worked on this particular mural. And, uh, and it's quite inspiring. And as you can see that there are people of, um, you know, who are involved in the African-American struggle right through history, as well as you can see Daniel O'Connell is in there and uh, Nelson Mandela from South Africa is there and other people from, uh, from around the world. So it's quite inspiring actually, and very imposing. Yeah, it's beautiful. And um, to the right of Frederick is Daniel O'Connell. And the woman who's to the right of Daniel O'Connell is Mary Ann McCracken, who was a Protestant and who was one of the founders of the Women's Belfast Anti-Slavery Society. She was an incredible woman. She lived to be in her 90s and in her 90s, she was still an activist. So she is truly inspiring. And there's going to be a statue to her in the centre of Belfast soon. So, you know, we, as Don says, we need more women. Um, I was in Belfast in 2014 with Congressman John Lewis, 
and it was very beautiful. Again, Don was involved in this, but at that point, John Lewis was added to the mural and he didn't know. He was sent away to get some coffee and then he brought back and suddenly he was there and it was a very, very moving moment. So um, if you are in Belfast, I encourage you to go and see the mural. So uh, to get to the statue, finally, um, this statue is by an English um, with Irish roots uh, sculptor called Andrew Edwards. And Andrew is a great friend of Don's and this statue really came about again it was inspired by Don and by the visit of a certain president to Ireland, President Obama, who came to Ireland in 2011. And as Don said, he'd been made very much aware of Frederick Douglass's relationship with Ireland from St. Patrick's Day when he came in office and of Frederick Douglass's relationship with Daniel O'Connell. And so when he came to Ireland in 2011, he really paid tribute to these two great men, these two great human rights activists who were very different, but in some ways very similar. And again, this really inspired Don in terms of the statue. So, Don? Well, my hope is, or was at the time that uh, we might get uh, President Obama to unveil it. I think I made a huge mistake in partnering with uh, University College Cork um, because it never happened. And I think that the president at the time lost interest when it became clear that President Obama's visit to Ireland was going to be quite short and he wouldn't be going to Cork. So if I had worked with a Dublin-based university, I think we would have had the monument raised in Ireland. And I think President Obama would have actually un unveiled it. Um, but it's still my dream to have the monument unveiled. Um, because it wasn't happening in Cork, Andy and I, we talked and Andy said, Don, I can create um, a resin replica of the statue. Um, it'll look like bronze by the time we have actually painted it and so on. And uh, we arranged then that President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama were actually shown the monument uh, in, in the um, resin format. Uh, along with the Taoiseach at the time, Enda Kenny. I think you have a photograph of it, haven't you, um, Christine? I Maybe do. it's further down, is it? It's, uh, it should be coming up. Um, it's further down, so we'll further wait. Further down, we'll yeah, you, you can see it, it in a while, you know. But uh, when eventually it is unveiled, and it is my intention to ensure that it's put up in, you know, the shortest time possible, it will be the first monument to an African-American uh, in Ireland and it will be the first monument to Frederick Douglass in Europe. So that's another great reason for actually um, um, having it done. And of course, then we'll talk a little bit about the symbolism later on because uh, there was a lot of thought went into it. But the other thing, of course, what we wanted was many of the statues of Frederick Douglass, you know, showed him as an elder statesman, but we wanted to highlight, you know, a young Frederick Douglass, a dynamic, a fighter of human rights, uh, and the abolition of slavery in America and eventually around the world. And so we, we depicted him at the age he was in Ireland at the time, which was 27, and as a powerful young orator as well. Okay, and um, if you don't know President Obama, he when he came to Ireland, he actually visited his own family roots in County Offaly, a place called Moneygall, and that's um, President Obama in the local pub drinking the obligatory pint of Guinness. And I just have to say, Frederick Douglass would not approve because Frederick Douglass was a, <laughs> a teetotaler. He was a temperance man, so he even retook the pledge when he was in Ireland. So just this is the statue and we want to talk about the symbolism. So Don, do you want to talk about the symbolism? Yeah, um, interestingly, uh, the former president of Ireland, Mary McAleese, who actually comes from Belfast, um, she was going to champion it. Um, and this was before the announcement of the visit of President um, Obama. And she was planning to, to bring the idea to the United States. Um, but we had a meeting with her in RS and that was uh, Andy Edwards and myself. And um, Andy arrived in early and he walked through Dublin and he saw the O'Connell Monument on O'Connell Street, which is really imposing. And he was very taken by the long cloak of Daniel O'Connell. So that's what actually inspired the, um, the, the, the long cloak. And he, he, when you see it from behind as well, it's amazing. It's like the, the flag of freedom that's unfurling. 
and uh, and he wanted to kind of show him as an orator speaking out against the storm of oppression. Then the waistcoat uh, is um, uh, representing um, uh, President. Uh, God, sometimes my mind uh, goes blank. Uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, because again, Lincoln had a great uh, respect for, for Frederick Douglass and they met on a number of occasions. And of course, uh, Frederick Douglass was given a cane belonging to uh, President Lincoln. The hand is an actual studied uh, hand of Barack Obama. So it's actually the hand of Barack Obama. And uh, if you look at Barack Obama, very often he'll raise his hand uh, in a gesture like that when he's speaking. And then the ground uh, is, is depicts... Um, like Ireland and um, and the United States, like with kind of water between it, de depicting again that friendship between um, the two countries as well. And There's another his, symbolism as well. Yeah, go on, yes. sorry, Christine. Um, in his left hand, um, he's holding a copy of the Irish narrative because you probably know Frederick Douglass published his life story in May 1845, his narrative. And because of the publicity it gained, it really forced him to seek exile. Um, he knew he couldn't stay in safety in America anymore. And so reluctantly, he had a wife and four young children. He left America, sailed to Liverpool, stayed two days in Liverpool before going to Ireland. And his initial motivation for going to Ireland was because a Quaker abolitionist printer in Dublin had offered to reprint the narrative, which he did within a few weeks. It sold out 2,000 copies, and so a second Irish edition was published again. Uh, very interestingly, Frederick became very involved in the second edition and uh, really um, groundbreakingly insisted that he write his own preface, etc. But in Frederick's left hand is a copy of the Irish edition of the narrative, which are actually um, very rare, very hard to get hold of. But I think, Don, you had one for a short period. Yeah, well, no, it was that book, in fact. And um, it was a friend of mine, Todd Allen, and uh, his nephew who bought it to me, I think, as a birthday gift. And I really, really appreciated and cherished it. But then I could see the interest of, of President Mary Michael Lee. So I said to Todd, I said, Todd, would you mind if we presented it to her, you know, uh, on your behalf? And Todd agreed. And I happened to have it with me that day when we went to meet President Michael Lee. And immediately, um, you know, Andy Edwards uh, said, we should incorporate that into the actual um, into the actual monument. And he took photographs and measurements of it and so on. And so that actually was inspired by an actual um, edition that was printed in Ireland at the time uh, of Frederick Douglass. And just the statue is um, beyond life size. It's over eight foot by eight foot. And when the statue came to my university, Quinnipiac, the original plan was that it would be in the library um, alongside an exhibition um, to mark Frederick's 200th anniversary, but we couldn't fit it through the library doors. And so um, it had to go to the law school, but it is, you know, it's larger than life. And as you can see, it's really very uh, full of energy. It's very animated. And as Don said, unusually and beautifully, it depicts 27 year old Frederick Douglass. Let's see if I can move this on. All right. Okay. So sorry, this is the image that Don talked about before, um, visitors to Frederick and Douglas. So back of heads, but you probably recognize them. You may not recognize the man in the middle and the man in the middle. Can you remember, Don? Oh, that's the Taoiseach uh, um, and the Kenny. Yeah. 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 So the um, Taoiseach at the time, Ender Kenny, a Mayo man, um, showed uh, the president and his wife and um, the statue. So I think you get a sense of how big the statue is from that image. And then um, it's a bit blurry, but this is 2014. The statue was still in Dublin. And that's um, the great late Congressman John Lewis, soon the statue with the government minister. Eamon Gilmore. Eamon Gilmore, that's yeah. correct. So, um, as Don said, there were two statues and the original statue is bronze. And a few years ago, the University of Maryland um, wanted the bronze statue. And you know, Frederick was born in Maryland, etc. So it seemed a very appropriate coming home. And myself, Don, and a few members of the committee uh, were present at the unveiling, it was very beautiful. And just from our short time in the University of Maryland, we saw that very, 
quickly, the Frederick Douglass statue became really a site for students to come and air some of their grievances. And again, Don can talk about you know, what they were doing and our meeting with the students on that occasion. Well, what was, you know, at that time when the statue went up, there were a lot of protests in various American universities concerning, you know, uh, stadia that had been named after either former slaveholders or people who had actually supported, you know, maybe the Jim Crow laws and so on. And, um, you know, and, and there was, a, you know, a very active group in uh, Maryland University who wanted their stadium to be renamed, which it subsequently has been. Uh, but what was really wonderful is that, you know, once they created a Frederick Douglass Plaza or Frederick Douglass Square in the university and put the monument there, there was a real sense in the students that they were being heard and were being respected. And uh, it then became the lightning rod for when students had uh, protests or wanted to make their voice heard. And so it's not just this group, I'm not quite sure uh, what it is they're protesting there, but I mean, I, it is now the center where students go if they want to raise an issue. Um, so it's, and, and it allowed also for very important dialogue between the university hierarchy and the students as well. So it actually avoided a lot of con potential conflict actually in the university. And as Don said, um, there was a resin statue and the resin statue is an exact replica. And the idea was the resin statue, even though it's exactly the same dimensions, because it was lighter, it would be essentially traveling. And the statue that you saw in Dublin was the resin statue. And it was in Dublin for a number of years. And then again, John was very involved. It came up to Boston where it was very much loved. And then a group in Colorado asked if it could go to Colorado. So this statue traveled to Colorado and sadly, and this is another story, but um, Frederick ended up for a number of months, long, long months, um, exiled again, this time in Colorado. And Don and I talked and we decided that we, we wanted Frederick to be in a safe place. And so I brought him back to my university um, in January 2018. It proved to be very tortuous and very convoluted because um, Frederick went missing for a few days and Don and I were very worried about what happened to him and finally on a very dark a snowy January night Frederick Douglass arrived at my university it was about 9 30 at night um, again all sorts of stories associated with that but anyway we took Frederick in um, sadly he was cracked in many places his beautiful cloak was cracked his right hand was broken. Um, again, very symbolic because in 1843, a mob had pulled Frederick Douglass off a train and broken his right hand, it never set properly. So in some ways that was history repeating himself, but he was in very bad condition. Um, his legs couldn't sustain him, etc. But we worked with a local um, sculptor who restored him to his resplendent beauty. And since that time, Frederick has resided at Quinnipiac University. Um, he didn't fit in the main library, but he's found a beautiful space in the law school. So this is Frederick in the law school. And again, I know from students who are in the law school, they just love to see Frederick. I know our public safety officers are very protective of him. Um, some of Frederick's descendants has visited Frederick and feel very moved by seeing him there. So it's, it's for me, it's wonderful to have Frederick. Um, like all of us, he's spent a year in isolation, but he's coming out of isolation isolation again. And if I can just say that uh, my own current work is, as Don said at the beginning, looking at other Black abolitionists who came to Ireland. And so you know, I'm very much framing Frederick in terms of this continuum of these amazing men and women who visited Ireland, uh, Black abolitionists between 1790 and 1860. I've brought up one volume on 10 of them. I'm trying to work on the second volume. So you know, this is part of um, a much larger project for me and I'm also working with Don on a number of projects. Um, one project and then I'll hand over to Don is we are creating in Ireland a Frederick Douglass Way to link up some of the places Frederick spoke at and in May we launched um, a pilot trail in Dublin and in two weeks time we're going to launch a pilot trail or walk of 
the places Frederick is associated with in Belfast. And all this is being done, um, as Lenny said at the beginning, in conjunction with the African-American Irish Diaspora Network. And we're hoping people will visit Ireland and take part in the walks and visit the places and get a feel for what Frederick saw and the people he met and the experiences he had. Um, Don, do you want to say anything more about the trail? No, no, I think that's, that's, that's perfect. I'm just conscious of time as well because there are other people to present after us, Christine, okay. so. So, okay, so just to, um, really, we're getting to an end. So we are, and I know Lenny is very interested, we are also going to create a Frederick Douglass Trail in America. Again, Aidan is a African American Irish Diaspora Network is overseeing this. And what we really hope is that now the world is slowly opening up again, the beautiful resin statue that has been at Quinnipiac can now travel to other parts of America. So again, if you're interested, you it's big, just to warn you, but it's absolutely beautiful. And the shoes you see are actually at Frederick Douglass's own shoes. So um, that's the shoes he wore. And just to end by saying, you, Stu, we've talked about Stu, statues as being divisive, but you very much um, statues can be unified. And these are some statues that Don is very involved with. So back to you, Don. Well, just, just very quickly, the one in the middle, uh, my boyhood hero, uh, I, I think actually <laughs> subject to question, and this is one to, bowing to the historian, uh, Professor Keneally, but I think subject to uh, correction, I think I'm the first Irish man in history to have erected a statue to an English man. And uh, that was my boy, <laughs> hero, who was the great English goalkeeper, Gordon Banks. And uh, the statue uh, depicts him holding the Jules Remy Trophy, the World Cup, which England won in 1966. And uh, I managed to get uh, Pelé, the great Pelé from Brazil, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu to actually come and unveil it. In fact, I'm there on the right-hand side slightly, but my face is uh, covered by the elbow of Pelé, which is not a bad thing. And uh, then on the right-hand side, uh, again, this was Andy Edwards. That was the beginning of my connection with Andy. Uh, I'm always looking at counterculture possibilities as well. And I'm very taken by, uh, I think, probably one of the most important events in, in the history of the First World War, which was the first Christmas when um, German and British soldiers and, and French soldiers um, agreed on a truce the following day, on Christmas Day, uh, 1914. And they went out and they met each other. And what was important, that propaganda from both sides had led them to believe that they were fighting monsters on the other side. But when they met each other, they realized that they were, you know, fellow human beings. They discovered their common humanity. And um, the generals made sure you know, for subsequent Christmases that it never happened again. Uh, because when you encounter the humanity of your enemy, it's very hard to kill them. And uh, so I talked to Andy about this. And, and if you notice, it's, it's the two hands haven't clasped yet. It's about that moment of taking the risk, you know, that's um, just the bravery of that. And it was ordinary soldiers and low ranking officers, many of whom were punished afterwards for actually having taken part. The place where it's in is Mazin uh, in, in Belgium, in, in Flanders. And in fact, there was, and this is part of, a, again, a legacy project that I'm working on. Uh, there was a German soldier there who refused to take part in the Christmas truce because he believed that it was fraternizing with the enemy. Um, he was billeted, and this is, <laughs> if you were making this up, you, you would think it was really bad fiction, but he was actually billeted it in a farmhouse called Bethlehem Farm. And in the crypt of the church, which is aptly named St. Nicholas Church, after St. Nicholas, who gave the name to Santa Claus, uh, there are, the crypt was used for both the communication center and as a um, field hospital. And he actually was treated for wounds there and recovered there. And the name of that young uh, German soldier was Adolf Hitler. So it's another reason why it's so important that the Mazines was where we chose to put this particular uh, monument. And on the left-hand side, this is a maquette uh, at the moment, and it's uh, a story of a young Dublin uh, soldier who, um, because of poverty, joined the British Army and spent three years uh, on the Western Front. And uh, he was in a place called saint Quentin. the on the night of the great German offensive called the Spring Offensive, when they tried to end the First World War before the American forces had actually 
really become embedded. And uh, they sent their stormtroopers. And um, young uh, Private Burke was wearing in his breast pocket a crucifix that his mother had given him, a metal crucifix. And a bullet went straight for his heart, but it actually deflected off the left arm of the crucifix. Um, so it didn't go through his heart. So to some extent, that saved him. But he was still seriously wounded. But he always maintained that it was a young German officer who actually picked him up and carried him to a field hospital and saved his life. So again, I'm, I'm interested in stories of humanity in war rather than the glorification of war, because if you know, soldiers who have been in war you know, do not come back to boast about it, very often soldiers who've gone through the trauma of war become very silent. And again, it's very sad to see, I mean, in the United States, so many veterans you know, who are homeless, uh, and suffering depression and post-traumatic stress and so on. So um, I, I, as I said, I'm interested in creating monuments that are about counterculture. And I want to see, you know, in the next decade, if God spares me, more monuments being put up to African-American people, as well as monuments to women who have made great contributions. And, and Don and Christine, let me ask you, how do these monuments and statues create civic engagement and visual literacy in, in the communities which they reside and what is the lasting memory of animating democracy that uh, one gets when they walk away from the, these statues? And I'm particularly thinking of the Frederick Douglass statue, but also the other projects you've worked in. How do they create, for, for people who are not steeped in the history, a sense of civic dialogue and civic engagement, and how do they animate democracy? Well, I, I know Don will have things to say, but I think anything visual, it's they're democratic because the visual literacy, you don't need to be highly educated, you don't need to read a scholarly book, but everybody understands visual. It's accessible to all. And Frederick Douglass, we know he's the most photographed man in 19th century America, and he saw photographs as a form of democracy. At that stage, he believed they couldn't lie, but he believed that photographs were telling the truth about him. And I think that's what visuals do. They um, provide a representation that can provoke an immediate reaction, um, in some cases, um, a very visceral reaction. But I think they're just accessible to all. So in that way, like Frederick and his photographs, I think they're just the ultimate form of democracy. Um, and being in public spaces, they don't cost money to see, you know, they're open to all. And I think when you see a powerful image, not all statues are good, but when you see a good statue, it really provokes you to want to know more. And you know, to me as a historian, if it wants you lead you to read a book, that's great. But if it just leads you to ask one question or to challenge one stereotype, to me then it's a democratic form of a dialogue. Even if it's with yourself, it has to be good. I'm sure Don, you have thoughts. Yeah, well, Don, would you care to uh, expand or uh, add to that? Well, very quickly, like I mean, the it was very interesting that the, the statue to Gordon Banks. Um, I realized that there was no statue in the Western world to a goalkeeper. And of course, I was a goalkeeper when I, I played soccer as a boy. And, uh, and I decided I'd change that. The Russians had put one up to a very famous goalkeeper called Lee Yashin. And I felt, well, I can change that. And, uh, but what was really interesting was we did not get a lot of support from the men in suits who now control soccer. Because like, soccer has been destroyed in, in the United Kingdom by money. Um, but it was the ordinary folk, the people who uh, knew Gordon Banks, and, and Gordon Banks always remained approachable. He was never one of these prima donnas, you know, who was untouchable. And he would talk to people. He was kind to people. I remember when I met him as a boy of 14, and, and the man that I met then as an adult, you know, was the same Gordon Banks that I met as a 14-year-old. And, and it was just beautiful. The ordinary people of Stoke City uh, got behind us. And when Gordon died two years ago, um, it was amazing. The statue became the, again, the touchstone where this incredible local, national and international outpouring of, of sympathy um, and, and love for Gordon Banks and his family um, happened. I mean, there was literally like scarves and, and shirts and so on, probably the length of a football field, 
placed all around the monument. And uh, the family actually invited me to, to offer a eulogy at his funeral as well, which again was an extraordinary uh, uh, privilege. And, uh, and I think what we're trying to do as well with the Frederick Douglass resin statue now is again, to actually give it the impetus that we brought it to, the, the Irish government paid to actually bring it to the United States. And that is for it to tour um, so that other people can see it and appreciate it. And uh, because not everybody will be able to go to the University of Maryland, not everybody will be able to come to Ireland to see it. So the fact that, you know, it can tour. And the great thing is then you can create all sorts of things around it. I mean, you, you can have lectures with people like uh, Professor Keneally. Uh, you can have locals, uh, people talking about, you know, the whole issue of Black Lives Matter and so on and, and telling the story of, of the struggle of uh, the descendants of slavery to still to this day uh, achieve their equal rights in a country that offers so much and yet has offered so little. Um, you know, Don uh, and Christine, thank you so much, not only for participating in this session, but for all of the conversations that we have during our uh, board meetings and our working groups in which you enlighten and advance advance and inspire me and uh, and that committee. And Don, your conversation about all creating all kinds of dialogues around the statue and around the monument is an excellent transition to our next pair of guests uh, from the National Museum of Northern Ireland and their numerations uh, statue and project. and. I've just learned this word, memoration. Those of you who know me for the, more than a day know that catalytic agent is my uh, goal as well as my brand and my nom de plume. And I've been able to, to work as a catalyst in uh, collaborating uh, in some way on the content of the next uh, presentation and statue, but especially a catalyst in bringing uh, Lyme and Kevin to our Chautauqua and Forum. And so as we uh, thank Jeremiah and Dawn and Christine, we move to our last presentation before a footnote at the end. And a, a welcome, Lyme, and welcome, Kevin. And uh, I'm excited to introduce you to our colleagues and uh, our participants in the Jatapa, and um, could you tell us about this exciting and unique interdisciplinary project that you? Thanks, thanks for that uh, introduction, uh, Lenwood. So um, uh, I'm not sure if I have to, I have to control the screen, so I'll just ask for the uh, slides to change as, as, as I need them. So um, I was uncertain really how to, how to present this uh, a statue sculpture. So I've, I've put all the names there, sculpture, monument, mem memorialization, and uh, contemporary reflection. So if we move on to the next screen, um, we have the working title as um, Murmurations. So um, not everybody gets what a murmuration is, but if you see a large number of birds flocking in the air and making different patterns, this was the inspiration behind uh, the idea that our artist uh, Kevin Kevin Killen had for the for the statue. So just moving on to the next screen there. Um, the statue is is or the monument the the sculpture is uh, going to be um, located at the Austin American Folk Park, which is an uh, uh, open air museum outside uh, in Oma. Uh, Northern Ireland, and it features Irish immigration from Ulster to America. And it has particularly got quite strong links with that early migration of, the, of people from Ulster, um, sometimes known as the Scotch-Irish, to the, um, the Appalachians. So um, most of you in America will be familiar with the Appalachian, tr Appalachian Trail. Uh, and you also probably know now that the Appalachian Trail has become the International Appalachian Trail and it now, um, uh, it now runs from America right through Canada into Greenland into Iceland. Uh, so if you see the next slide. 
uh, OAC. This is the, the reason. Um, the, the reason that the International Appalachian Trail became the International Appalachian Trail was because 225 million years ago, um, Europe and America were very close together. And then over the last 225 million years, it has drifted apart. So the, the geology of um, certain parts of Europe and the Appalachians in America are very cl closely, closely linked. So if we go on to the next slide. Yes, you'll see there um, in yellow, the pieces of geology that basically fit together to some extent. So the International Appalachian Trail runs now from America through Canada, Greenland, Iceland, um, Scandinavia, uh, Ireland, England, um, Northwest Europe, down into uh, Iberia, that's Spain and Portugal, and right the way down into Africa and to Morocco. So these countries are all now linked in the International Appalachian um, Trail. Next slide. And this is where the trail uh, goes through Ireland. It, it goes through uh, the north of Ireland. It starts off in uh, Donegal, which is part of the Republic of Ireland, and then moves across the border into Northern Ireland. Uh, passes close to the Austin American Folk Park and then heads on up to the north coast and um, to Larn. So the local district council um, wanted, uh, or the local district, the local councils were involved in on, um, trying to um, invigorate this trail and our local council um, wanted to locate uh, an art piece to celebrate the links between Ulster and um, and the Appalachians, and they, they uh, ran a competition, and uh, our, my, fr my new friend, Kevin Killen, was the successful um, applicant. Um, uh, about 23 people uh, applied, uh, we shortlisted that down to about four or five, uh, and they brought a, a second proposal, and Kevin um, was unanimously and was head and shoulders above the other proposals, and um, we were very excited to get to get to work with them. Um, you'll probably be a wee bit shocked to hear that um, this only happened about three, three or four months ago, and that Kevin has to have the piece finished by October. So we have really had to rush at this, and um, it's pretty crazy stuff that we tried to do in such a short period of time. But I'll let Kevin talk you through now. Um, his his involvement in the in the artwork, and then at the end I'll come and I'll say something about the collaboration that um, led to me um, uh, meeting with uh, Lenwood and uh, many other many other people. So over to you, Kevin. Okay, hey guys, um, I just want to thank everybody. It was really fascinating to hear what people were talking about there. Um, and if we can move on to the next slide, if that's possible. So. When I, so when I engaged with this kind of tendering process, it was tricky just to find one piece or one figure of piece or uh, to, to, to sum up what I was trying to do. So I kind of went through the landscape a wee bit, the cartography of the landscapes. You go to the next slide. And then I was interested in this day of a constant flow or a constant movement, because immigration isn't a still thing. It happens today and it happens in the past. So the idea of, of working with memorations is, is, is a part of my work anyway. And if we go to the next slide, and then this is the idea of, I want to spend a bit of time in this slide just to talk you through it. I really would like to, I'm really trying to get a, 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 a medium to work with. And I use the idea of words. I like, um, I know sometimes people, when we're doing this kind of thing, we do figurative work and very symbolic work. But I like the idea of using the building blocks to words, to people's journeys, the stories they tell. And I like, the idea of, I like the idea of different languages that people can imprint onto. And the idea when you read a book or when you read a sculpture or when you read um, a piece of artwork that has words involved, subconsciously in your mind, you begin to bring up images. And I really wanted that play that you would engage your work from afar and you wouldn't know it's made of words. And then when you walk closer to it, you would see that these are words and people can start to read elements of it. And it twists and turns and it forces people to kind of walk in and around the artwork. Um, but again, a lot. I like the idea of the rich cultural heritage of people from one part of the world going to another and the stories that they tell along the way and the stories that they tell the generations ahead of themselves. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think. So this is just a viewpoint of how it moves and turns and the idea of maybe the, the landscape. And, um, and I didn't want to have anything too embedded within a, 
uh, a mountain range or I wanted to keep it as abstract as I could. And uh, I was really interested in, in trying to figure out a way that wouldn't date, that you wouldn't put it up this year and within 10 to 15 years it would become a little bit obsolete, a little bit old. It's not really involved around one individual figure, it's involved in hundreds, thousands of people. Um, and I wanted something that in the idea that the language changes over time, that a word, what it means today, maybe in 50 years down the line, could change again. Um, if you go to the next slide. So I really wanted this energy, this life about it, this movement, even though it's a still piece, it has a, a, has a, a flow to it. Um, and the next slide. So yeah, this is in contact. So it's about three meters tall, by about nine meters long. And the entire piece of you were fit to get this thread and pull it out, it would be probably about 11 meters or whatever it is. So there was maybe I think about 600 words involved. And uh, Liam will talk to you about the, the, bringing together the different words and different elements, which is incredibly tricky, how to weave all these different words. Um, and the reason why I like to, I really wanted to use the words because words have an energy, it has, when I'm talking to you now, I've said it so many times, when I'm, I, there's an energy when I'm kind of, your brain's picking up the words through your ears and it's translated into words, but it's really energy that I am imprinting on to use. And words are so powerful. They can mean so much. You know, a word can change a society, it can change uh, a person's belief, you know. So I really like the idea that the words we have chosen for this piece, which is quite tricky, are important. And Liam wanted to come up with an idea as well that the people who have chosen words would have a reason behind those words. And that would be almost like a, a digital or virtual um, book of some kind that could be continued to be built upon when this piece is set up and I can walk away from it. But it has a legacy that people can keep on building on this virtual book. And I think that's an interesting element to it as well, rather than just doing a, a sculpture and it's there and people walk away and they can get a bit, but they can engage with it. Um, and really, if we hit the next slide, uh, just some details. Um, again, hit the next slide. Yeah, this is just a tail end. Again, as Liam says, it's very tight deadline for this. Um, uh, I, 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 it's a tricky project to engage with initially, but we just have to kind of work ahead. If you go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, that's my workshop. And you hit the next slide. That's just me, kind of, that's the kind of initial patterns, initial um, uh, movement of, of, of the artwork. Hit the next slide. And Liam, I'm going to bring Liam in now. He's going to chat about the, the, the really, it's a more trickier task. You know, coming up with a concept and making the work is probably relatively easy. It's getting the words and bringing these words together. So Liam will I'll no doubt chat, chat to you about that. But thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, thanks for that. So um, it was very exciting to start to work with Kevin and to see the, f the fact that we had got these words to play with and how we were going to play with them and how we we're going to make the best use of them. So um, we had a bit of a discussion and we decided that we'd really like to open this sculpture up to maybe be a bit wider than just the idea of links between Ulster and Appalachia, uh, you know, because that could be very, that could be a very tight, rigid uh, constraint. And we opened up in a few different ways. Um, I'll try and remember them all. <laughs> first of all, the first thing that we thought of was, you know, along the Appalachians, the first, you know, the first people there were the indigenous nations. And we really wanted to get them embedded into the into the art piece. So we're very fortunate because we've been the museum itself has been working, or and myself in particular, I suppose. Uh, you know, I've been trying to get reach out, make con good contacts with uh Indigenous Nations people um, over in America, and wasn't really working that well. I suddenly got worked up with um, some um, an, a university in England that was doing really good work, but they weren't really able to put me where I really needed to be. And I happened to be at a conference that was hosted by um, my good friend now, Christine Keneally, and I met this wonderful girl, Michelle, who was. Um, uh, um, Half, half Cherokee and half Scottish Irish, but very, very much involved and they had a huge amount of contacts within the Indigenous people. And the thing just completely took off. So we've been able to get buy-in from not just the Ch Cherokee Nation, but a lot of the um, Indigenous tribes along the Appalachians. So basically every Indigenous tribe that had been along the Appalachians at the time of um, 
settlement or invasion or however we want to describe it, their name is, is appearing there, plus um, with some words applied by them. So that was one element of it. Then um, the next element was at the Ostermagen Folk Park, we have, we have some houses from, um, from America that associate with um, Irish, Irish settlers. And it's quite surprising just how many of our stories that we feature actually, actually um, have got narratives involving um, African, African-American and slave people. So that was something I felt was quite important to get up there as well. I reached out to Lenwood and talked to him. Uh, I was through the African-American Irish Diaspora Network, first of all, and then made contact with Lenwood. And he made a number of suggestions. So within the piece, and we'll go back again to Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass's name is going to appear there. There's only about two or three names that appear on Frederick. Frederick Douglass is one of them. Dick Anderson, who probably nobody knows, but he was the guy whose idea it was to have the International Appalachian Trail. His name appears there. And um, uh, Christine mentioned um, this lady, Mary Ann McCracken, who's probably one of the, mo- one of the strongest Ulster Irish woman characters of the 19th century and heavily involved in the Appalachian, her name appears in it as well. So that was sort of our, you know, we sort of like that, that was, and it's not a tech box thing that we're doing there. This was the start of a, of a journey because we want to um, uh, get these stories told better in the park of, you know, where Irish, Irish migrants at the sect with um, enslaved, uh, enslaved people and um, free African Americans, and also where you know they had um, the, the the stories overlap with uh, Native Americans. So it was brilliant to get it started and to get work done that you know people could really see that we were genuine about moving forwards and want to build on that. So this sculpture, when it's finished, it won't be an end; it'll be a start. Then you know, obviously, we. Um, really looked at, you know, historic Irish migration, you know, both to the Appalachians, but then also, you know, to places like Philadelphia and New York, which aren't that far, far away from the Appalachians. Uh, so we got captured, try to capture the urban and the rural uh, migration flow to America. But then to go and, you know, I talked to a lot of um, academics about that, including uh, Christine and uh, numerous others, both in America, in Ireland, in England, and even in Europe. So that was great. But we still want to extend another, another bit. We felt that migration, migrants, or, you know, can be somewhat of a pejorative term today. And we felt we wanted to show the universality of the migrant experience. So Northern Ireland doesn't have a huge number of um new migrants coming, coming but the, the, the new communities are, are building up. So we reached out to about 12 or 15 new communities in Northern Ireland, including the Polish community, the Lithuanian community, um, the Indian community, the Chinese co- community, and you know, ask them for their experiences of migration in terms of words or phrases. And then the, the other idea we come up with is with us, and the, the, one of the universalities around migration of all migrants was the word hope. So we've incorporated the word hope into this um, piece in many different languages. So you'll see some Chinese writing there, um, and you'll see a number of words in foreign languages, and um, it's also in Hebrew and in Yiddish. Uh, the word for hope, because this was. Nobody, no migrant, unless they're forced, at, completely forced, no migrant leaves a country thinking that they're going to a worse place. So this this was one of the things that, you know, that everybody sort of um, um, bought into, including, to be fair, uh, and I've, uh, somewhat to my surprise, a little, the um, Indigenous Nations also wanted to have that more hopeful idea of their future rather than the idea of just sticking with this idea of the trail of tears and how, how badly done they were by. In fact, they asked me not to put the um, the phrase trail of tears into the sculpture, which of course I, I, I haven't. And just picking up on something that um, Jeremiah um, Muller had said earlier on about his uh, um, uh, about his uh, man, Mr. Yule, this idea of, of resilience was another thing. And this was someone I think that came through also 
when I talk to um, Denwood, the idea of, of resilience and not, you know, um, taking it on the chin and lying down. So these are, <laughs> that's a huge amount of ideas to get into your head and there's a huge amount of ideas to get onto up in a sculpture. Um, we're working with a, with a poet at the minute and he is, put the words uh, together in a certain way. So that's what you're seeing on the screen now. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, I maybe should have ran through these slides as I was speaking, I would have given you a wee chance. Um, he took, uh, we're still working on this here, so it's, it's, not, it's not finished. This seems to be his final draft, but he has sort of deconstructed um, some of the ideas, you know, and um, put them up against each other. So the words don't all come Together that will be associated with one, um, with one idea or another idea. Um, next slide. So you, you see there, it's. I'd just like to point out. I don't know if you can see it there. Um, fiddle, jig, jump dance, jump dance, but, and banjo. That was a line that uh, then would give us, which I thought was a particularly beautiful line because it kind of symbolised the the friendship between the, the Irish and the Af African, African Americans, you know, and because there was also animosity, obviously at times as well, but it was lovely that Leonard was giving us that there and, and we felt, because any, we really wanted people to give us the phrases. We didn't want to sort of select phrases unless, you know, they were kind of Irish or from our own history, but we really wanted people like, you know, um, to give you know um, freely of, of those phrases in the same way with the um, and indigenous nations, you know they give us some phrases quite freely as, as, as well. Um, I can't pick out any at the minute, but it was the idea that. And then, as Kevin said earlier, what we are hoping when the sculpture goes up that we'll go back to a lot of these people and they will write little word pictures of the phrases or the words that are in the sculpture that they've chosen or, and this can evolve over time that, you know, anybody that sees a sculpture can add to that there. So it's hopefully going to be a sculpture that's going to evolve over time. Um, next phrase. Yeah, so um, just try to, I mean, for example, there's a phrase there, please let the flowers flourish. So that's actually a, a, a phrase from our uh, Chinese, um, local Chinese community that they give us. Um, and then there's a phrase there, farewell struck like a weighty magnet, like a weighty mallet. And that's a phrase from um, the Scotch-Irish or Ulster Scotch, which is kind of an English dialect, but very much used by the um, by um, the Ulster, 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 Ulster Scotch um, uh, dialect. So we're trying to, and we have Irish phrases in there as well. We have the phrase and, and bad ban, which basically means the white ship, but it also means the emigrant ship because the white ship was the white sailing ship with the white sails. And this idea also maybe of a ghost ship and just a, a lovely phrase. So we're trying to weave all these things together to create these different pictures. Um, if you go on to the next slide. This was um, a more structured approach that I had put up there. So you can see there, um, for example, um, the and 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 orange. I would have structured together all the um, Af African American words close together. Um, the the words in the yellow would have been from indigenous nation words. And then I was trying to use the word tobacco to link, because tobacco was really sacred to uh, Native American people, and it's probably one of the reasons, one of the first reasons that um, uh, enslaved African Americans were brought over from Africa to actually cultivate tobacco as, as a crop. To be sold on, you know. So I was trying to, uh, hopefully, you know, the sculpture would probably link these two things uh, together. And then again, um, lower down there, you'll see um, the words in, in pink would be ideas in around the uh, Scotch Irish um, heritage. And then the words in sort of blue. These are links where I'm trying to link um, some past Irish migration experiences to. Um, um, to, to refugees across time, you know, so the idea of infection and hunger, famine, um, people making crossings across the Atlantic Ocean or across the Mediterranean or across the Channel, the idea of linking coffin ship with dinghies um, at the minute we see quite often on our news, you know, people trying to get across the Mediterranean Sea or the Channel and these makeshift dinghies and kind of 
trying to make a linkage between them and coffin ships and the much sympathy we feel for Irish people and coffin ships and maybe the lack of sympathy that some people feel for people in these in these in these dinghies. So uh, the thing is that this here is going to be placed right outside the the doors of the of the museum. And you're going to really the, the person coming to the museum is really going to see it and be forced to engage with it because they can't avoid it. It's, it's, it's so big after they visit the, the museum. And maybe it'll make them think, maybe with a little bit more empathy towards our, our, our new migrants and our new communities in, in Ireland and Northern Ireland and relate them to the, the welcome, you know, that we kind of maybe expect or hope that our, you know, migrant uh, forefathers who left for America would have, would have got. So there's a lot of ideas there. So I'm just going to leave it at that point. Uh, hopefully we have time for a few questions if we can answer them. Or if, if not, we'll just have to close there. So thank you again for Lenry for giving me uh, the uh, chance to uh, present this. It was, it, was, it was wonderful. Lyme and Kevin, I want to ask you, um, and, and friends, we'll, we will go over about 10 minutes for those of you who can stay with us. I wanted to ask, the, the two of you, how did the fourth time or the, uh, the uh, quick step of time uh, uh, of the project, the shortened time of the project, impact the creative process uh, and how did it inform the decisions <laughs> that you're making? Uh, that's a good question. I do not, I can honestly sit here now and because I'm not sure how long it was since we first spoke, Lenwood, but it seems like a long time ago, and I don't really know how we did it. I think um, we're not at the stage yet where I think myself and Kevin are happy with the placement of words. I think we can polish it a bit more. Uh, you know, we're a bit worried that the draft, that the, the poet has deconstructed the ideas a, a little bit, and we're un, uncertain if that's the best way to go. I think we're quite happy that we have the right words. I don't think we're, I don't think we've felt that we've missed out on very much. In fact, just to share someone, as a thought, it only, you know, I was talking about uh, yesterday, and the thought came to me. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the sort of the Muller and Baby Homes scandal uh, in Ireland, and you know, a lot of these unmarried mothers were forced into these Catholic homes and babies were taken away from the mothers and then they were adopted. And a number of them went to the United States of America about 1600. And we have sort of put in a few words in around Af African American um, words. One word was creolization, and then we put in the word uprooted and the word stolen. And then I started to think if you think about how those um, babies were moved from Ireland to America, it sort of reflects almost that idea of being uprooted and stolen and cut off from your natural culture. So the sculpture. Uh, still speaking to me as as it goes along, but it's it's all there. So sometimes the last time you have, and you just have to get on with it. It can, it can actually sharpen. To, to my mind, it's almost sharpened sharpened the process. Uh, excellent, thank you, Kevin. How as the artist, how did the uh, shortened time and the quick step? Uh, impact the decisions that you made and the creative process? Um, I think for me, I always like to engage in a pro in an artwork that has a multi-tiered process. So there's many different elements to it that one might necessarily hold up the other. So some projects I do, they kind of just they look at your portfolio and they like your portfolio and then they bring you in and then you throughout the process, you create a new piece of work within that process, but just as different we had to come up with the idea before we got the work or before we got the commission. So in a way, for me, the design was all kind of ready to go whenever I, whenever I was successful. The only element we had to kind of work on is what we're working on now is actual gathering of the words and bringing the words together. And that, you know, Liam has taken the lead in that one. Um, uh, I'm really, so I'm prepping the, the, the jigs and, 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 and the workshop stuff and the behind the scenes. So there will come a time that I will, probably need the words ASAP. But at the minute, you know, as Liam, as Liam says, sometimes that the shortened process can sharpen the minds and bring people into. By all, I would like to have, you know, I'd like to spend four or five months on, on the words. And I think, but I think Liam has done a great job in getting 
the correct amount of words that he wants, that, he, uh, that, 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 that the stakeholders would like to have in. Now it's just a case of trying to cleverly weave these words together into a picture, for one of a better word, or a kind of a story, um, a, a, a visual oral story, really. Um, so, you know, sometimes you have too much time, all times too short of times, but the deadline, this is the end of October, um, I think, but there's always kind of, because it, it was just such a squeeze, um, they probably maybe let that spill over a wee bit maybe, but um, yeah, it's, I think a, a lot of jobs in, in, in this part of the world, you know, there's a certain amount of funding there and it has to be spent by a certain amount of time. I have always said repeatedly, you know, for a good project to have, you need a proper amount of budget, you need a proper amount of timetable, and you need a, a, the proper clients involved who support you, whatever it is. Uh, it's very rare you get those three elements together, but you can always work it, you know. Um, yes. Okay, and I want to ask uh, the, the two of you one more question. I'll, I'll ask my colleagues, uh, presenters, and our participants if they'll put questions both for Lyme and Kevin and for the other speakers in the uh, chat, and we'll be sure to post your questions to our guests. But I wanna ask the two of you gentlemen before I, I do the wrap up, what words or phrases or concepts shook your sense of reality and changed your lens or paradigm of thinking about this project? Um, well, for me, at just coming out at the right time, I mean, the Austro American Folk Park of um, um you know over time <laughs> staff would cut back and land, but the only curator uh, left there, although you know, I'm still in the same position now as was, but uh, I'm still there. So I've been working on a, a, a long ideas of you know really having a much better narrative, um, bringing African Americans in from the edges of our narrative and, and indigenous uh, peoples in from the edge of our, our, our narrative. And things are, the, the, the ones have changed and started to go that direction anyway, but I'd been working on well before that. So it was very easy for me to move in that direction. And then this sculpture came along and just allowed, allowed almost, you know, to create this almost like a manifesto for where the, the our museum should be going and you know senior management have, have bought into it to a certain extent they were moving in the same direction because that's the way the one was was, was blowing them so it just magnified everything I was feeling it gave me a real sense of purpose in my career I'm probably coming towards the end of my career now and um, I just thought that you know this is one thing where I can really put my emotion into it's the right thing at the right time and I feel very very much a part of it. Although for, I am very conscious that, you know, I'm a middle-aged white man and it's really this idea of co-curation, which I probably haven't said strongly enough. Like, that's why I was so pleased to get Lenwood involved in it and then so pleased then also to get my new friend, Shell, from the, um, from the, the Cherokee Nation involved so that we could have that idea of co-curation. And the, uh, the idea of co-curation went through with all the other groups as well. And we wanted to move, you know, we want to keep this dialogue with the other groups as well so that, you know, new migrant groups can feel a place within the museum. And if they haven't, don't feel it for the minute that sculpture is a start and that the dialogue will continue to create a better space um, for them. So yeah, it's, it's the right thing at the right time for me. Over to you, Kevin, <laughs> sorry. Sure. Um, well, um, I think, you know, originally, uh, when we're doing this kind of community, you know, I work on a lot of cross community projects throughout the north. Um, words are playing a very powerful role. You know, a lot of the community works I do, some words you can't even have and mentioned. So the freedom we had within this piece of work was amazing. You know, there was never really a no, we can't have this word, or, you know, we didn't want to do like a fairy tale romance, the idea of this from immigration. We really wanted to kind of have this truth and all its different shades. Um, that was, you know, that was a curiosity for me because it was the first time we had, I had actually freedom, you know, to kind of not be afraid. But I really wanted to give the ownership to the people, the stakeholders who, um, who, who, who were giving us the words. I thought that was, you know, and sometimes in the past projects we got them and we started to edit the words in and out, and we, you know, and I thought thought that was very unfair. But just we haven't, we've kind of kept it quite raw. And another thing I find really interesting that that. I think it's important for any piece of work that has a legacy or has a continuation is that the visual oral book that we're going to do or the virtual reality book we're going to do that has 
a much more detailed history of the words we use and the reasons behind them, the people behind them. I think that's going to be a more, probably a bigger legacy uh, once this artwork kind of comes up. The artwork's just more or less a, a, a catalyst to start dialogues within people and um, within communities. So, you know, uh, immigration and especially in this part of the world is, 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 is a tricky subject to, 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 to work with. Um, and I don't want to use the word precious because that can be seen as a negative in the creative field. So I think it's important to um, uh, um, just trust people, I think. And I placed a lot of trust within Liam and the stakeholders to give up me the words as building blocks and bring these words together, hopefully in a way that people can uh, read and in years to come, reread and maybe get new meaning out of it. It's time they come and see the work. I think that's it. Thank you, thank you so much, gentlemen. That 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 the that the work itself is a catalyst uh, for the conversations that continue to resound by the viewers, by the stakeholders, and by the commissioners and artists. Uh, thank you very very much. I hope we can continue this conversation by our guests um, plugging into your website and following the project as it comes to fruition. And as the words fly like the enumerations of the birds <laughs> that you are, are talking about. I promised you all that we would go only 10 minutes over. And I'm going to ask Christina, she'll bring up a slide uh, presentation, which will move through very quickly in five of those six minutes. And then um, we'll uh, close with thanking the library. So, this is going to be very quick. It's mostly visual. I won't talk much through it, but it will give us some thought. And Christine, if you'll bring the slide presentation up. We've been talking about putting monuments up, and we've been visiting uh, Pennsylvania projects, national projects, and international projects in this conversation. But we want to also end with this very politically charged concept of taking monuments down. So, Christine, will you, when you have it, I can't see your screen, but when you have a slide yeah, sorry, presentation sorry. up. It's up. So, will you go to slide number two, please? Mm -hmm. Slide number two talks about today's history, and it shows you a map of Confederate monuments across the United States. And you can see that the majority of these Confederate monuments are below the Mason-Dixon line. But what we don't realize is that the majority of these monuments were put up not after the Civil War, but between 1920 and 1960. That's a shocking thing because the, the concept is that they're historical and commemorative uh, memories, but this is really the proliferation of Confederate monuments is a 20th century phenomenon. Will you go to the next slide, please? This was Fox News' report uh, yesterday about the Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson statues uh, uh, coming down. And if you'll go to the next slide, uh, MSNBC countered Fox by saying that the, the taking down of these monuments was like the firing of the first shots of the Civil War and the firing on Fort Sumter. Would you go to the next slide, please? It was very interesting that public and private contractors with very mixed feelings about taking these monuments down were contracted in cities, many of them who were antagonistic about them being removed, but were responsible for the movable. Will you go to the next slide, please? And even while the conversation of taking them down was going on, a counter conversation on both sides was taking place where I, it was interesting that Don Mullen brought up about blowing up uh, monuments and uh, 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 the, the uh, sacrifice versus feelings of sacrilegious. The next slide, there were advocates on both sides, as you well know, for the support for these monuments 
and the support for taking them down. Next slide. And there has been a call to arms in 31 states to actively resist the taking down of these monuments. Next slide, please. But even as there's been the active support for these monuments, there's been an equal force and equal energy to demand that they be taken away from public spaces. Next slide, please. In fact, vigilant societies, now that's a 19th century word, both in the abolitionist model of vigilance and in the uh, white supremacist vigilante model, vigilantes and vigilant societies have been countering and protecting the monuments at the same time that they have been supporting the taking them down. That confrontation has become physical in 19 of the 31 states in the United States. There is actually active civil unrest and civil war going on in the streets. Next slide, please. There's also been acts which we call sorry bari, stirring it up, mixing it up, stealing parts of monuments. Next slide, please. Mobs have uh, unceremoniously taken these monuments down while militias have taken to the street to counter their actions. Next slide, please. And we are now engaged in a great civil war, as Abraham Lincoln said in the Gettysburg Address, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Next slide, we are met on a great battlefield of that war. And we think of battlefields as these abstract and romantic places. The battlefields were actually somebody's farm, somebody's main street, somebody's churchyard, somebody's train station. And in all of the places that we are taking down these monuments, these confrontations are taking place. And yes, they have even resulted in murders, deaths, and uh, mortality. Uh, on the battlefields of America. Next slide, please. Our newspapers are full of the agitation on both sides of these um, uh, deconstructions of our history, reconstructions of the responsibility of public space, and defiance of the laws passed both to protect them and to take them down. In the federal uh, government, the, uh, the federal law was passed, the legislation was passed to remove all Confederate monuments from the House and the Senate. But legislation is a ruling. The administration of that legislation is yet to be seen. And so we have lots and lots of questions about not only taking these monuments down, but since many of them are being taken down in an organized way, the biggest question that senators uh, of Pennsylvania and the slide before were four senators of Pennsylvania who this morning introduced legislation in committee because our, our, our Senate and our House is in hiatus, legislation to to question and suggest where do these monuments go after they're taken down? Should they be warehoused? Should they be placed in contextual museums? Should they be put in a special uh, park in Gettysburg as a national uh, and federal park? has been suggested as being the repository, depository of these co uh, Confederate monuments. I would love you to put into, those of you who are still with us, in the chat what you think should be done with these monuments in your block, in your county, in your state, in, in the nation. Where should these monuments go once they are decommissioned and taken off of the public block. They are artifacts of the past, 
and they are property of the federal, state, county, and local governments. So the big question of the day, and the question on the news tonight, is what to do with them, and where should they go? And I would love for you all to weigh in on that so that I can send the senators in that picture, DeSanto Republican, Gordner Republican, Street Democrat, and Hayward Democrat, the co-signers of the, of the resolution and the uh, legislation to remove these statues from Pennsylvania public buildings. But the question is, and do what with them? <laughs> then what? So what? For what? And uh, I leave those questions with you, but I'm thinking of Don's conversation about blowing things up. And uh, if we don't come up with an answer, the public might come up with that answer for us in a less than a civic way. So that's where we're going to end for this evening. Those of you who are with us, please post uh, either questions to our guests uh, or your comments about the question, what should become of these monuments once they are taken down? Where should they go? How should they be decommissioned? I thank Jeremiah and Dawn and Christine, Liam and Kevin for being with us, uh, especially our colleagues at the Dolphin County Library System who are creating the Thomas Morris Chester Research Center. The body of our work and the body of these conversations will be placed in their archives so that communities, researchers, scholars, and students and guests can explore these conversations for weeks and months and years to come. As we put things up, we take things down, and that is the dynamic exploration of our history. We thank you all very much, and also thank you for your patience as I tried to work out a number of technologies to be with you. And now, we'll say good night. Thank you.